exam schedule as it currently sits, um, I don't have a problem with you guys bringing your lunch into the exam. I do think it's a bit unfair to have three exams without a food break. I mean, that's just, that's usually, even on your standard um, FE exams and stuff, they only do four hours of exam, then you get a break. So <laughs> only four. And then, and then you do the other four in the afternoon. So it's an eight-hour exam, but they do allow you to do it as a break. So, um, so I don't have a problem with you picking up lunch on the way. And, and I think, I, I'll double check, but I think the final only has like 15 questions on it. It was my recollection, but I will look at it. It's already made up, so. That scares me. How long are the questions? Well, they're optics questions. Okay. Yeah, they're optics questions. Boo, 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 boo. All right, so, so in here, and if you have not gotten enrolled for spring, I think we've got just about everybody except for Diego. I don't think you're enrolled yet. Oh, uh, I graduate this semester. You're graduating this semester? Okay. Yeah, because I didn't see you enrolled, and you're going on this semester. So I think everybody else is enrolled, right? We got, we got everybody? Okay. All right. So in on, because of where things were, it's not in the materials and assignments, but there's this lovely week 14 in here. If you click on this lovely week 14, um, I have put in the paperweight problem that works through everything. This is, an, this is an interactive one. If you go to LiveScribe, there is a voiceover on this. So you can actually hear the voiceover as, we work the, as I work the problem. So that one is in there. Um, the flat mirror problem, similar. On the flat mirror problem, it's there with all the voiceover. There is the concave mirror. Um, this one, green has voiceover, okay? If it's black, it doesn't have voiceover, but green has voiceover. So it's got voiceover in there. Um, so there's that paperweight. I think this is the same one. It's just that I have it in a double couple places. It had a title differently, and I wasn't sure. This is a mirror PowerPoint. I think a couple of these are the same, but we're going to go through this one. So you have multiple PowerPoints associated with mirrors and lenses, and this is images. So the last PowerPoints are actually in through here. So you've got all, everything is in here um, under this lovely week 14. So we're going to do a bit of review, and then we're going to do a couple other pieces in here, just so you can see a little better apparatus for Poisson Spot, and another image of Poisson Spot. So this is, um, you can actually generate Poisson Spot by having an object that's casting a circular shadow, and we get the wave that generates, generates those things. <coughs> we talked about this. But Wednesday before the test, that we have the particle nature and the wave nature of light, and we get Planck's constant, and that deals with energy. And uh, I have just found the coolest video. Um, it came through early this morning that looks at why antique glass will turn violet over time, turn a violet color. You'll start out with clear glass, but over time it will turn violet. It gives you, first, it gives you the chemistry of what's going on. Because remember, glass is a silica, um, and a lot of glass has iron in it because you're using essentially sand. But they actually, in order to get clear glass from back in the Renaissance, they would put a little bit of mangan or mag MN, manganese. Mag magnesium and manganese always drive me crazy because they sound a lot alike. One's MG, one's MN, but it's the MN one that's the transitional metal one. Anyway, if you have the iron and the manganese in there, manganese starts out at a plus three and will go between a plus two and a plus, uh, plus three. And one of them gives you the purple color. 
and one of them gives you the, the neutral color. So as it's bombarded by ultraviolet light or some other radiation, over time, it will go convert from the, the, the two plus oxidation state to the three plus oxidation state, which will give you the really cool color. But then you heat it up and the color goes away because you give enough energy for the reversal of the oxidation state. It is pretty cool. So you get that lovely color and you get the energy and that's the whole bit about the energy and why it lights a particle um, in our photon. So light encompasses both nature using this, the Einstein's version with energies equal to the Planck's constant times the frequency, we get both aspects of light. As you move on and you get to your upper division classes and if you deal with more optics in your upper division classes, this is where things are quantized because you're jumping from one energy state to another energy state. And that's where we're going to solve for wave functions to have wave solutions. And so that's where a lot of the quantum physics will come in, a lot of the modern physics and things like that. So we get that each photon has a particular energy. We talked about how we can look at our front of waves as a ray, which allows us to do what we call geometric optics. And they're parallel. And even though waves are going to go out radially, it's like looking across the parking lot. We know the surface of the Earth is curved, but when we look across the parking lot, it looks flat, right? Because we're talking such a minute, teeny, tiny portion. And it's the same thing with what we see with our, with our optics um, that are there. I talked to you about the ray optic simulator, so you can actually see some really cool things. You can put lenses in there and mirrors in there and play with it. It's, the, it's a Google um, extension on Chrome. And so the, as you're doing your homework, if you want to bounce rays around, you can actually can and actually focus them and play with them a little bit. So the ray optic simulator is really nice to have to play with it. It gives you an optics bench at home. We talked about reflection. I'm going to turn the lights off in here. You may want to turn the lights off over there, Robin, because it's a little hard to see these videos. It's even harder to see it when we're underneath. But uh, that is specifically reflection. All we're doing is hitting the surface, and that's going to be a mirrored type reflection. Because if you can see, it's not going into the glass underneath, so it's going to be on the mirrored side. And remember that the angle of incidence from the normal, so if I have my normal here, my normal is going to go straight up and down, the angle of incidence is going to equal the angle of reflection. And that basically, we saw that in momentum, so if I bounce a ball, this gives me that particle nature, I'm going to bounce it off and I'll get that, that reflection. So that angle of incidence and reflection. <clears throat> we demonstrated this on Wednesday. And you guys actually have done this in the lab. You can have your incident, incident beam come in. Part of it will enter into your glass or your medium below. This is the refracted ray. This is the reflected ray. This is sitting up on top of a mirrored surface, so we're not going to have transmission through. But I'll get my reflected ray here, and then I'll ultimately get the refracted ray. And the difference, of course, is I'm going to have two different media, which are going to interact with the light waves slightly differently, and I'm going to get bending of the light. And we're about to see why, so just kind of going back and forth between the two. If I have just specular reflection, that's off of a smooth surface, everything bounces off nicely, and then I can have diffuse reflection, and we talked about that being the little crystals and stuff that you get in reflective paints in order to get um, that specular reflection, and it makes things glow, it makes um, dry road easy to see at night, it helps us out. We talked fun fundamentally about the law of reflection, the incident ray to the exit ray, and then we've got our refracted light that goes in, which was leading us to Snell's law. 
So by definition, the index of refraction is the, diff is the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum divided by the speed of light in the medium. Okay? That's, that's how we define the index of refraction. So we get, we get this lovely de definition. And we can deal with the angle of refraction depends upon the material incidence as the light goes through the refracted surface. Okay, so when we're going to get here, and we've talked about this, I'm going to go back, just so previous. If the index of refraction is greater, glass is going to be like 1.33, and, and air is, is really close to 1. Um, so speed of light in air and the speed of light in uh, a vacuum are very, very close. But if I have the, the um, a greater one, if the index of refraction is greater, it's going to be bent towards the normal. If it's less, it's going to be bent away from the normal. So that's how we're actually going to see the ray of light bend and then the ray of light bends away from the normal. So one goes towards the normal, and that's an increase. If I have a decrease, it's going to bend away from the normal. So for vacuum, n equals 1. For other media, n equals greater than 1. Air, even though air is very, very close to 1, it is still greater than the vacuum. So as the value n increases, the speed of the wave decreases. And this is where things get a little weird, okay? So let's look at this for a second. We've got our, our wave hitting the media. So if I'm going from here to here, the light travels, the frequency of the light doesn't change. Okay? The frequency of the light is not going to change. So the wave front, because so if we know the wave fronts don't pile up on each other, we are going to, you know, they're not destroyed at the boundary, so the frequency has to stay the same. They don't pile up on each other. We get a change in wavelength. And so you get this weird weirdness that comes in there. The frequency remains constant, but we do get a change. And you can do the wavelength is related to the index of refraction, and you can get those ratios. Now, most of the time we tell you this, we go through it, and we tell you all about it, and then we don't use it at all. It's just to justify Snell's law based on our mediums that we work with. I, I'm not even sure I gave you a homework problem on this one. If people have dived into it. I used to give a couple of homework problems on it. Um, the, the idea is that we, we end up with the, the ratios and the Snell's law. So to look at this, like I said, there's air. So it's really, really close to one. Same with carbon dioxide. It's really, really close to one. Water's 1.33. Diamond is like 2.41. You can actually use indexes of refraction to identify unknowns, particularly in organic liquids. We use the index of refraction to distinguish between cyclohexanol and hexane and because they are different and you can actually, it's really easy to measure an index of refraction and so you can actually use it to distinguish between organic solvents. And, and that and makes it really, really helpful. So you, you can do it with a lot of fun things. Now, some things that you want to look at Flint glass, crown glass, fixed uh, quartz glass, all of those glasses are different types of glasses that you'll use for different functions. So if you end up dealing with optics, you end up using the different glasses for a lot. And it doesn't even have sapphire in here. Sapphire is used a tremendous amount for cuvettes for optical instrumentation. So when you're doing Beer's Law, infrared, um, the, we end up using a lot of sapphire cuvettes uh, because it's sapphire and quartz because you can get them transparent 
and the sapphire ones I used a lot because sapphire was a good heat sink. So you weren't necessarily heating up your liquid when you were shining light through it and working with um, some of the high intensity lasers. So we would actually use, I actually use sapphire plates um, like like microscope slides for a lot of my work because they I didn't I could they it would dissipate the heat, so you do get saf so sapphire is a is a common one that's used for a variety of different different things. So we have lots of good good pieces that we play with. Um, ice is a little different than water, and it makes a little sense. So we can apply indexes of refraction because it's gonna help us get dispersion with white light because blue is gonna behave a little differently than red's gonna behave, which is gonna be different than green is gonna behave, and you get your dispersion. And you can look at the color aspects. Let's see if I got this one. So if I go to here, hyperphysics, if you, by now you can look at how we perceive color and it's based on the actual fundamental anatomy of the eye. I can never remember, um, so we have eyes, we can look at the diagrams and look at the different pieces there and which colors come in. This one doesn't actually give me what I'm, what I'm about to try to figure out. And see if this one does. Okay, so there's, there's the blue person's perception of color. Um, but intent, but with our rods and cones, one is one is sensitive to the intensity, and one is more insensitive, more sensitive to color. And so rods and cones have different functions, and so that uh, you, you can go to different aspects of it. So Snell's law is good. So this gives you the dress. Okay, this is the dress one. Um, the original, this is the one that got posted on the internet, and if you give it a lighter background, so, so this one, some of you may see blue or black, some of you may see the gold and white. So look at this one, how many of you see the gold and white, although now you can probably see, so you see the gold and white, does everybody else see the blue and black? Yeah. Okay. It's depending upon how your brain is dealing with the background. Fundamentally, it's depending on how your brain, if you've got the lighter background, and this one, everybody should see the golden white. No, I see black and white. And this one even? Yeah, I see the lines of blue too. Yeah, I see Well, these will have a little hint of blue lines in it, at least, at least the way I look at it. I don't see any gold. Yeah, no gold. I see gold. No. Okay, this one, you should, most people should be able to see the golden white. This one, everybody should see the blue and black, yeah. which is the actual dress, by the way. And the, the, this one, you should, you should be. So now, if we go look at the shoe debate, I actually pulled it up. There are the different images of the shoe. In most of them, Okay, do you see the gold and white in this one? You still see the blue and black? Yeah, blue and black. <laughs> this one's definitely blue and black. This one's gold and white. That one looks blue and black. Yeah. Let's see if they got this one. Let's see if I can get anybody to be able to see. Okay, what color is this one? Blue and black. Blue and black. I get a light blue and kind of copper color on that one. Now this is another one that they've got, they faded out with the Y. Blue and black. Yeah, they're all blue and black. <laughs> see, I see all three colors on that one. I, I get the blue and black and, and get there. But this is the... This is the pink and white shoe that looks teal and green. See, that's what I see is teal. I see mostly teal and green unless it's on this guy's feet. Mm -hmm. I see mostly teal and green. Yeah, they've actually got it where it's distinct for this guy's foot. 
And they've got one where it's the catalog picture. If we go back, there's the catalog picture. And the catalog picture should be mostly pink and, pink and white for everybody. It's the background that causes you to view the teal and green. And it's how your brain is filling in the data. Okay? It's how your brain is filling in the data. Now, this is with color. I will tell you that you will all run into this as you proceed in your career that your brain will fill in the data. Your brain will fill in the data when you are proofreading a document. If you're proofreading your own document, your brain will fill in the data, particularly if you're reading it on the screen. There are a lot of times that if you print it out and read it, you actually can see it differently because your brain fills in the data. Your brain, and I think if everybody's seen it on the meme, if you can read this, then, you know, and it's left out all the vowels, or it's left out all the R's, because your brain fills in the data. And that's something that you've got to watch out for in a lot of different things. Your brain will not see something because it's out of place or something's not there. So your brain actually does a lot of image processing and it will, it will fill in gaps that, you may, that may or may not really be there. And so you've got, to, you've got to be very careful about that. That's why we transpose numbers a lot, because your brain is, you know, if it's a familiar number, even if you're not dyslexic or don't have dyslexic tendencies, your brain will flip-flop numbers because it's a more familiar number to you. Your brain does weird things. And, and that's one of those things that you do have to watch out for when you're trying to, you know, it'll fill in a lot of different things. Now, if you're bilingual and truly bilingual, you've changed thoughts, you change languages, and your brain will do it on a piece of paper and you have to watch it. <laughs> I went to high school with true bilingual people because they lived in Panama and they would switch, you know, if I'm walking into this store, we'll, we'll speak English, and if I'm walking into another store, we'll speak Spanish. And I would get letters from my friends, they would change thoughts and they would change languages and wouldn't know they were doing it until they got to their freshman comp exam and did the same thing and the teacher wrote ha 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 on the freshman comp exam because he started out, the first paragraph was in English, most of the document was in Spanish and the last paragraph was in English and when he reread the paper his brain changed languages and he didn't even know he'd done it. So brain does weird things <laughs> and you can fool your brain and that's why you can do these pictures like this. Well, oh, I'm gone. Where is it? There's my... Yeah, he had to go in and explain to the teacher what was going on. Not, not a good day. But that's why we can actually, for a lot of people, we can get them to see both of the different colors. Not everybody, but we can get people to see both of the different colors. So it's kind of an interesting, interesting thing. So the eye and color, so we're going to take a stop and watch that. Oops, escape, escape. Hopefully this will play sound over there. I may be a completely blank animation, but that doesn't mean I still can't appreciate a colorful painting every now and again. But when I look at that painting, how can I actually see its colors? To answer that, let's take a look at the electromagnetic spectrum. Because light is both a particle and a wave, it has a wavelength. And in the visible portion of the spectrum, those wavelengths correspond to a particular color of light. Sadly, humans, and animations like myself, can only see a tiny sliver of the entire spectrum, but we'll take what we can get. An important fact about light is that it can reflect off things and get absorbed. For example, let's think about eating a nice crisp apple on a warm day. The white light from the sun that's hitting the apple can be broken down into all the wavelengths of visible light. However, most of the colors except red are absorbed by the apple. The red light is reflected off the apple surface and reaches our eyes, causing us to perceive the apple as being red. The color is essentially just a sensation. The back of our eye, called the retina, contains two different types of light receptors, and these are called cones and rods. The cones are responsible for color, while the rods are responsible for our 
dark adapted vision at night. The rods are so insensitive to color that they can't even see red. In fact, this is why astronomers and sailors use red light at night. It doesn't affect their already dark adapted eyes so they can still see clearly. But going back to the cones, we have three types. Red, green, and blue. This may sound strange to you because in elementary school you learned that the primary colors were red, yellow, and blue. Well, I hate to break it to you, but that's a lie. For light, the primary colors are red, green, and blue. We call these additive colors because if we add them together by shining different colored lights on a wall, the closer to white we'll get. And if we mix varying amounts of red, green, and blue light, we can make any possible color, including pink, my favorite, which doesn't actually show up anywhere in the visible spectrum. As usual, I'll be answering a new question every Thursday, so ask anything you want in the comments section below or on Facebook and Twitter. I'm Blocko. This has been Life Noggin. Don't forget to keep on thinking. Some accident. I can help you file a claim on the State Farm app. My insurance app doesn't do that. Indeed. Let's split a cab for the car. Ah! Hey there. Welcome to Life Noggin. I make. still have or have around anywhere a tradition the old tube color TV no you asked me that like two years ago I'd say yes <laughs> you still have one not anymore uh, it, we had one recently but if you put a drop of water on it you can actually see the three pixel colors of the red green and blue for those who mix lights, we do this all the time. Okay, when we're mixing lights, we have we have the magenta. It's magenta, and what's the blue one? Just blue. Yeah, there's blue. My favorite color mix is surprise pink. It's not actually pink. It's purple. It's purple. Well, there's a but but you you have the three you have the three colors that you you mix to get your various colors for your spots. And it's three filters that we use. Well, you do the same thing on a color TV, or you do the same thing with light emitting diodes, that we get the three colors, that we can actually mix the different colors to get the variety of colors that we see. And that's why those color, you know, the, the good old, pe the, the good old um, peacock for NBC has the body in the three colors because they're going to deal with whether or not I'm going to have the blue, the green, or that magenta e color. It's not really a red, it's kind of a pinkish red. But you get but you end up with those three and if you mix them together you get white. And if you mix any of them together you're going to perceive the variety of colors that we have. Which means if I'm doing printing and I'm doing mixing and getting pantone colors, I'm using this kind of an idea in order to get my color color waves that, that we're going to see. Now, what we see is the reflected light, what gets absorbed. So black is total absorption, white is total reflection, and then the various colors in between, which way we're going to get them. But that's why we've got those three different colors that we use for color TV. And I think if you play with the liquid plasmas, you can see the three colors. It's just not as easy as it was on the old tubed color televisions because you could really see those phosphors that are up there on those pixels that we ended up with. So that's where our colors come from, or at least colors that way. Oh, it's just that it's one o'clock. So, so we talked about this on Wednesday, and this is basically where we stopped on Wednesday, but I didn't have all my slides and everything because the computer was not being a happy camper. And we've got there in there. But Snell discovered this relationship. We used Snell's law to determine indexes of refraction, and we used the angle of incidence and the angle of refraction. So if you go to the, um, the, the chrome, the little chrome gizmo, 
you've got two different things. This is one material, this is another material. They have two different indexes of refraction. And we've got a protractor to look at what our angle of incidence is and what the angle of refraction is. So if I go in here and this is my angle of incidence and this is my angle of refraction, so this is at 31 degrees and this one is at, let's see that's 50, this is 20 degrees, what do we already know about the index refraction of this side? If it's greater, it's going to bend towards. If it's less, it's going to bend away. So this is going to have a greater index of refraction than this one. If I'm going from this to this side, this bends away, and it has a greater index of or lesser index of refraction. So that we can we can look at it. So you can play with those. You can see how the light bends. That's why I love the little app, because I'm coming from air to one thing, I get this teeny tiny little little reflection ray, and it comes in, and, I, and when you look at it on the, it's hard to see on the screen, but you'll actually see the reflection ray. So this one has, from here to here, this one has a greater index of refraction, so it bends towards, but this one looks like it bends away, so it's going to have a lesser index of refraction than this one did here. And then this one will bend completely back out. And I know you guys have one a homework problem where you're taking that index of refraction through multiple layers that, that you end up with. So we can, we can play with those. Now dispersion, so something with the index of refraction, except for a vacuum, depends on the wavelength of light. Snell's law indicates that the angle of refraction when light enters depends upon the wavelength. So if I have white light that has multiple wavelengths, I'm going to get dispersion, and that's going to be different for each type and how it's going to do this dispersion by wavelength. So crown glass has, if I'm doing the purple, has one part of index of refraction while red has a different one and I get this slope, so when I ultimately get to a prism, they're all going to bend slightly differently, and I can spread that white light out. I can use that dispersion to actually spread the white light out. So my white comes in with the incident there, so this would be our straight through, and as we go through, we can make it greater and greater so that I can get and actually see the blue the, the blue, yellow, green, red. I can see all of those that I get. And then we get this angle of deviation. And that's what this is called. This is the angle of deviation. And that allows us to get that spectrum of light that we want to see. Now that's a little bit different than a diffraction grating. Prisms will do the same thing if my light isn't pure white. So if I'm putting in, um, I'm putting in a hydrogen beam through my prism, make the, the color off that's coming off the hydrogen, and I look at it through a prism, I'm going to see that there are three predominant colors that come in. Diffraction gratings just make it really, really easy to see because I'm going to be able to get that dispersion just so. But prisms will do the same thing, just diffraction gratings are a heck of a lot easier to use than prisms. We talked a little bit about Huygens um, last week, and he gave us that, the, that we could use the wave, any portion of the wave would be the next, you know, could be the next wave. So all points give us wavelets, and we get the wavelets that can actually work through it, and we can get the old waves and the new waves and get propagating. And then I think we talked about total internal reflection to give me my fiber optic and we actually showed a fiber optic on Wednesday. So, now I filled in the gaps for where we are. We'll start mirrors and images on Wednesday, and we will continue to progress on, but I'm gonna let you guys out early today.